Welcome everyone to the Atomic Cinema Experiment. I am Peter and joining me as always is Tara. Greetings, citizens. This is a science fiction movie podcast. I don't know why I'm laughing at the way you said green citizens, but for some reason it, it, it tickled the funny bone. Uh, we yes. were laughing before we recorded. Yeah, maybe a little bit. Uh, so yes, yeah, it's a science fiction movie podcast and we are here today to actually go back to a, a franchise that we technically started a while ago. Way back at the start of the year before the, the new Invisible Man came out, which was a Screams review because it was more of a horror movie, but we did the original Invisible Man uh, for that film coming out on the Ace, and we said, hey, we should go back and continue that, uh, along with the fact that we're working through Planet of the Apes uh, over time as well. So, a um, bit slower on this one, but hey, we're here. So this is the Invisible Man Returns. This is the second film in the Invisible Man saga, if you want to even call it that. Uh, they're fairly disconnected films, though, admittedly. So, uh, mm -hmm. But this came out in 1940, so this came out uh, seven years, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, the first one came out in 33. So this is a little bit later. This came after, I believe, the greenlit this. I, I, I read a bit of the Wikipedia page today. Look at me doing the tower research. Whoa! <laughs> that's my job, uh, and I didn't do it. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> um, no, it was a couple of things I was curious about as I was starting the movie, so I, just, I had the Wikipedia page up to read some of the production stuff. Uh, apparently it was a very troubled production, but the, uh, yeah, this was greenlit after Son of Frankenstein was doing okay at the box office, so I thought, ah, oh, we'll do an Invisible Man, we haven't, we haven't, you know, returned to that well as much as the other ones yet, so, uh, we got this, and uh, my, the bit, bit that I loved, though, is that they said they cast an, an, un, an unknown in the role of the, the lead of the Invisible oh, yeah? Man, yeah, <laughs> which is funny to us, because Vincent Price is, like, one of the most famous it's actors. anything but unknown, yeah. yeah. Um... <laughs> The thing is, though, is when you do eventually, I, I guess this is a mild spoiler to see that you do eventually see him, but, I mean, we're spoiler-free to begin with, we'll give you warning before we get to spoilers, but you do t see him at some point. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't recognize, like, obviously I knew who he was, because the voice is very distinct, but when I first saw him, I was like, oh, that actually, he looks, he looks so young and different and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, so... Uh, so yeah, he's so cute. <laughs> young Vincent Price, which is funny, because a lot of his movies that I've seen are from the 50s, which... It's only like 10 years later. It's not that much time, really. I re I thought his voice was very different, too. He doesn't have his usual Vincent Price. <laughs> the kind that everyone does an impression of. Uh, yeah, I mean, the creepiness is toned down a little bit, but you can still tell it was him. You can still hear his voice. You can still yeah. tell it's him. So. In parts, yeah. Um, But yeah, you got Vincent Price and in the invisible role. Does that make it his first horror movie? That's an excellent question. Um, I'm going to say no, uh, because I'm pretty sure there's a movie on Prime that I've almost watched a couple of times, which and it's claimed to fame that it actually says on the description is Vincent Price and his first movie, and I'm pretty sure it's a horror film. Uh, so mm. I think it was unknown, so clearly this movie wasn't... In fact, that's probably why they're trying to sell it as, hey, it's Vincent Price's first movie, because it's got nothing else to, you know. Right, because that'd be funny, since, you know, his whole claim to fame is being like, what is it, like the Prince of Horror or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was in three movies before this one. Tower of London, The Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex. I'm going to assume that's not a horror movie. And <laughs> Service that's Deluxe. Uh, uh, those were in 1938 and 39, uh, the three of them. Um, Tower of London's a drama. Okay. Uh, Private Lives of Elizabeth and Essex is a biography drama. And Service Deluxe is a comedy. Oh! Whoa! So yeah, okay. <gasps> Invisible Man Returns is technically his first uh, horror movie. Uh, although I would say it's more of a sci-fi comedy than as a horror movie. Uh, very little of this actually feels like a horror to me. Well, I mean, Invisible Man's part of the like Universal Monster classic, so it's both. It's, it's a bit of both. But it's the same creature from the Black Lagoon. I'd put that in sci-fi more than I would horror. Hmm. Look for it soon. On the atomic cinema experiment. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't realize that was a thing that we could possibly do. Oh, yeah, I would. <laughs> Fish monster? Yeah, sci fi. Come on. <laughs> All right. Definitely. Forward to our review of The Shape of Water. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the we... Academy Award winner for Best Picture. Can we not and say we did? <laughs> <laughs> Is that possible? So. Oh. Yes, Invisible Man Returns. Uh, the basic premise of this one is that Vincent Price plays a character named Jeffrey, Jeffrey Radcliffe, who has been convicted for a murder that he did not commit, and he is to be hung. 
But the brother... Hank. Hank, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We've had this <laughs> conversation before. Clearly, I've just completely Clothes forgotten. are hung. People are hanged. Yes. Um, but he's going to be hanged. And the brother of... In fact, it's the... His, it's the Jeffrey's brother that he's supposed to have killed. He's supposed to have killed his own brother. But the brother of the character in the first film, although I think he's a different actor. Uh, I want to say, I didn't see the same name in the credits. Um, he uses the invisible serum to make him invisible so he can escape. Uh, but it all happens off camera. None of this is actually on screen. Uh, it just sort of happens. We find out after the fact all this is going on. And Vincent Price, as Jeffrey Radcliffe, is trying to prove his own innocence whilst being invisible. Uh, whilst the police inspector is kind of looking for him. And... It's maybe one of the more interesting things about this movie is that it does acknowledge the first one exists and mm -hmm. it does have like a police like chief inspector who knows that he's probably invisible and that he you know he's, he's planning for that he's trying to like outsmart mm -hmm. the fact that the, the person he's looking for is invisible uh so that is the the, the basic premise of visible man returns we will like i say start spoiler free here and we'll give you a warning before we go into spoilers tara how did you find the actually first of all did you see have you seen this before is this the first time watch First time watch. First time watch. Okay. How did you feel about Invisible Man Returns? I liked it. I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to because, I don't know, I wasn't really expecting very much from the movie, but it Is was it? pretty good. Like, I like the, uh, I like the, I like the plot. It's a lot more, there's a lot more going on than the first movie. Um, a lot of the comedy worked for me and I thought, uh, I don't know. I thought it was just a fun, a fun movie. Do you think your expectations were because... One, sequelitis, and mm -hmm. two, the idea that no one ever really talks about these sequels. No one really talks about the Invisible Man sequels. And that's true for a lot of the monster movies, to be honest. All, all of them, Bride of Frankenstein, all of the sequels mm -hmm. are just kind of ignored for the most part. And unless you're someone who's a completionist like we are, and you go back and go looking for them and whatnot. Um, I don't know. Uh, that was yeah, I found I found the characters really good in this. Um, I like that the police chief like knows that he's invisible, so he's always got this like really heavy cigar that he's smoking. So there's constantly smoke around him. It's really clever. Yeah, my favorite thing about the movie is probably whenever the, you know I love talking about mechanics in movies like this. Mm -hmm. Where my favorite stuff is them trying to like having tactics and like methods they're trying to use because they know he's invisible whether that means yeah. they're pumping gas into a room or they're intentionally doing things a certain way uh, and we'll get into some of those details as we go through it but and the effects look pretty decent for the time like even well it, i mean they looked good in the invisible man also in the 1931 because that was uh that was impressive when we watched it, it was just i wasn't really expecting it to look very good and i thought for you know the time it looked pretty good this one they do a lot more and yeah. it's only seven years later, and that was, and I was still impressed. Like I thought it looked really good. I thought but there's a couple of things where you can see strings, but yeah, I think it took longer than this. But apparently, they they initially were only giving four days of post production, which is insane. <laughs> 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 Could you imagine even like an indie movie having four days of post production these days? Yeah, that's that crazy. That's madness. <laughs> um, we got a deadline to meet. Um, I don't think I liked it as much as you did. I think I had the problem that. As much as I love Vincent Price, like this is not a, a dig at Vincent Price, but because Claude Rains is so animated in the first film, and because he's already went mad, because that's part of the plot, of course, of the first film is the, the 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 serum has made them go mad over time, so that's why he's such a, a you know a, a troublesome hijinks fellow compared to you know a normal person. Because Vincent Price has only just been made invisible, he's actually quite level headed for the a good part of the movie. And mm -hmm. I thought the characters, because of that, were a bit duller, and I wasn't necessarily into the murder mystery, like, you know, who the real culprit is kind of plot. I didn't really care too much about that. Uh, I did enjoy some of the effects, though, and I enjoyed... There was a part that kind of teased me a little bit. There was, there was a... I thought that the last half hour of the movie was going to all be set in one location, where they thought they had him trapped in, like, a mansion, and it was going to be about the police trying to find him in the mansion. And I thought, oh, this could be really fun. And it kind of ended up being wrapped up within, like, five less than five minutes even and then it was like back to just normal plot stuff so but it was a cool way that he escaped i know it was it was there's, there's stuff to enjoy um and i like you know beats in the ending and then stuff but I, there was definitely a kind of a almost a diminishing returns element to some of it where i, I didn't think 
the character was as entertaining as Claude Rains was, and Claude Rains is a big part of Claude why... Rains is so like energetic yeah. and like you said, he's already kind of in his middle of the descent to madness, whereas Vincent Price is pretty normal for most most of the movie. And it's funny because you think, you know, if you said to me beforehand, like, oh, who can maybe like try this now after Claude Rains? <laughs> who can follow up him? And it's like Vincent Price, if you said Vincent Price to me, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, Vincent Price is a good good try. Like, why not? But Yeah. I don't really see Vincent Price as that type though. I would say more of like, well, I mean, he wouldn't have been born or he would have been too young, but like someone very much like Claude Rains, like Jeffrey Combs or something. Oh you sure. Get somebody like that. Oh sure. I don't mean the exact same type of performance. I just mean someone who has enough character this this mm-hmm. thing to kind of like pull it off when you can't really see them obviously plus but, he's already well he's not at this point but he becomes the fly so that's more what he's known for right oh sure much later on <laughs> yeah um <laughs> but I, I i i genuinely didn't um i just thought, I thought the character was kind of dull for for most of the movie and that, that kind of hampered it for me quite a bit but uh, my favorite things though and the one thing that i will give this props for is that i do love that the police chief and they're like they know that the first movie happened they know that this character had this serum like seven years ago and they're actually trying to preempt things like the simple thing like you said like the fact that he's always smoking a cigar because he knows that that'll let him maybe get a glimpse of him if it happens to get close i really wish it leaned into that stuff even more because that's when i was having such a blast because like <laughs> These movies are relatively separate and fairly standalone, and I think going forward, you know, one of the frustrating things about whenever they do a reboot of Invisible Man or any other type of character like that is that you have to go through, it's almost like superhero origin fatigue, where we have to go through the characters kind of coming to accept that this this invisible person exists. So I love that this says, no, we're not actually going to do that, we're going to skip to the point where these characters do know he exists, and they're going to try and outsmart him. Yeah, and I, I really like that, that element too. Yeah. Uh, so that's my favorite thing about the movie. I think it's just okay, though, overall. It's kind of like a, you know, it's an okay sequel to me. Whereas I think you're a bit more on the good sequel side. Yeah, I liked I liked the, um, I liked all the visual effects, like I said. And they, there's a lot more of them in this one. And, uh, I, like, I wasn't expecting them to use rain as an element to, to find them. Like, obviously that would make sense in a modern day film, but for the limitations of the effects at the time, I wouldn't think that they would even try to do something like that. But they do, and it looks like, you know, for the time it looks good. The smoke effects look good. Um, I I enjoyed it. Some of it looks silly, but like you can see some strings moving or the way the leaves move when he's moving through a tree or something, but the branch doesn't have any weight on it. That's kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think you can sometimes see like like when he's moving, and it's particularly when he's like putting on or taking off clothes or something like that, and they've actually got him... Uh, not obviously it's not actually like a, a you know green screen if i i read that they did it with like black velvet like he wore a black velvet like suit against a black velvet backdrop but essentially yes. how they how they composited things you can kind of see like the outline of him sometimes as he's doing certain things or uh, you know little mistakes They're usually around the mouth you can sometimes see his mouth kind of opening and closing well there's one scene where he like drinks some wine and i think the velvet that he wears gets wet and you can see that kind of hovering mm. just like this wet spot yeah so yeah, there's definitely a little th- but it's kind of charming i'm not really complaining about this this is more just oh like this is the best they could do at the time and it, it actually is better than you'd expect there's definitely mm-hmm. some cartoonish stuff towards the end though where it just looks painted uh and we'll mm-hmm. talk about that when we get there uh so you know it's funny because when i read about the production issues part of what they said is that they, they turned the universal back lot into like a an english mining town which by the way have we ever really talked about the fact that all these universal monster movies for some reason are always like english characters like did hollywood have this hard on for like everyone has to be british everyone has to be pompous and rich british people like that's who we want that's that's who our monsters are yeah <laughs> we, are, we all, they all have to have manners and servants <laughs> and all the rest of it it's like i don't know there's this really weird idealism of uh this type of like you know posh british upper class kind of thing yeah, it's, it's still the the gothic horror the people in the castles that's the one yeah yeah yes i guess but they mentioned that they'd built like a two-story like main car kind of set so mm-hmm. i was kind of like because you see it in the background like early on as like an establishing shop i'm like surely there's got to be some big scene set there otherwise why would they build the whole set they wouldn't build that for an establishing shot so the yeah. whole movie i was waiting obviously the big finale takes place at the main area but 
Uh, yeah. I was kind of waiting for it all. So where's this main cart bit coming up? Because like, <laughs> they, they spent all their money building this big huge set. <laughs> Where is it? So, um, yeah. I think okay. it pays off. I, 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 you know, I, I think it's a decent enough watch. Um, it is though, it's a, bit, a little bit longer though. This is, I mean, obviously by modern standards, this is not a long movie at all. It's, 80, it's like 82 minutes. But compared to all the Universal Monster movies, like if you go back to those first ones, they're all like 70, 75 minutes. They're all mm-hmm. really short. And I know it's, like, it's only six, seven minutes longer. I know, but six, seven minutes longer feels a lot more when you're going from <laughs> 70 something to 80 something versus, you know, like two hours, five minutes to two hours, 10 minutes. That, that feels like I, nothing. I was but. expecting a shorter film when I sat down to watch it because I thought yeah. it's 40s. Like, it's going to be a short, short movie. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it's, yeah, it was a decent watch. Like, that's it. The nasty surprise I've ever had is sitting down thinking I'm watching a three hour movie and it's actually a four hours and 45 minute movie. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Until the End of the World. Yeah, that's a movie that exists and that we reviewed. <laughs> yeah, we spent like all weekend watching the damn thing because it was so goddamn long. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I, think I, ended, I think I ended up watching it twice. Tw- oh, geez. 10 hours for you guys. Damn. Uh, I just watched it once. It did take me two parts though. It was too much to sit in one sitting. Uh, it was just too much. To do. <laughs> That's what it is. It's a lot of hey, William Hurt. It's a lot of William Hurt. Um, and the actress who's also in Wings of Desire, the one writer's also directed. But go back and check out that review for those details. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. The review is not as long as the movie. No. It's pretty long, <laughs> but it's not that long. You could probably watch a review three times in the space of the actual movie quite comfortably. <laughs> so. Anyway. Invisible Man Returns. Uh, I think we're probably a bit ready to go into spoilers and work through the the movie. Um, did you have anything to say about the other cast members? Obviously, we talked about Vincent Price, but is there any others that stick out to you? I mean, the girl faints a lot. <laughs> yes, we're in the era of anything that remotely is stressful. <laughs> oh, I can't take it, sir. Ooh. At least we get a couple of men who faint, or I don't know. If, I think one of them faints and one of them just gets knocked out. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, I think thinking you're seeing a ghost, at least I... I mean, her her fainting at, at the Invisible Man's a bit weird because she already knows he's invisible, so it's just like, you should expect this, but she still faints anyway. But at least I will concede that thinking you're seeing, like, essentially a ghost because you, you don't understand what's happening in front of you and you're hearing mm-hmm. a voice and you're seeing stuff move, I will at least concede that that may actually cause people to faint because it's such a, like, otherworldly, shocking thing to actually see. I don't think mm-hmm. I'd faint. I think I'd be more, like... Uh, <laughs> is the afterlife real? Does God exist? Am I wrong? <laughs> I see what you're doing here. Right? Tara's trying to work at a debate that we had off camera and tell a sly <laughs> little comment there. Um, I simply said that I do not necessarily think that in a movie, if there's an afterlife, that that also means that there is a God in that movie. That's all I'm saying. You can have, the, you can have your own mythology of what an afterlife is separate from religion. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. No, I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're not doing that debate again. But, <laughs> um, all right. So we'll get into uh, the, 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 the spoilers. But before that, though, I will thank our Patreon producers for the month of... Sub- oh, tired of spirit there for a second. Huh? Can you click my button? There we go. All mm-hmm. right. So I will thank our Patreon producers for the month. Thank you to Tyler Hess, Cindy Palacios, David Sharp, Bored Now, Al Tribesman, Christopher Moy, and Brett Williams. Thank you to all you guys. Uh, and gals, you are Patreon producers, which means you are twenty dollars or more on patreon.com slash mailfest TV, but you don't have to support us at that tier, do you, Tara? Well I know. If you enjoy the show and enjoy our content, please check out our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash mailfest TV. And if you donate as low as one dollar per month, you will get access to bonus episodes of our show and you'll get bonus episodes for other shows, including Screams After Midnight, which is the horror movie podcast. So if you like Invisible Man, you might like Invisible Maniac, which is <laughs> on the horror movie bonus episode. That's so true. please check that out. Thank That's you. True. And if you donate five dollars per month, you will get access to these episodes uh, one day early. And other shows you'll get a week early. So please th- check it out. Thank you. I think that was fairly flawless and. Uh... Invisible Maniac does have a lot more boobs than this movie does, so if that's uh, something that appeals to you, uh, check out Invisible Maniac. No judgment. 
<laughs> I enjoyed that movie. <laughs> As did I. It was a, it was a delightful romp. Uh, about an invisible maniac. Uh, <laughs> I came all the way from Helsinki. Okay, so I think it was Belgium. Was it Belgium? Oh damn it! <laughs> I, the joke stands either way, but uh, Helsinki. <laughs> so yes, uh, full spoilers then for the Invisible Man Returns. So you've been warned. Uh, so the movie starts. Uh, we get like some of the servants who work for Mister. Cobb, who is the basically the guy who runs the mine, he's the rich guy in town, kind of thing. And he's waiting for information along with Helen, uh, aka female love interest character, mm -hmm. who's otherwise faint, 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 faint. Yeah, she basically has no character, she's just worried about the main character all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jeffrey, oh. <laughs> here's a question. The young Vincent Price was really strapping. Here's a question. How many women do you think worked on this movie who were not playing a female role, were not, let's say, I'll take out the matric makeup and wardrobe departments, right? How many outside of those departments do you think worked in this movie? Uh, I'm going to guess no. None. None, I'm, yes. I'm sure the makeup were probably men also. They might have been. They might have been. Um, the reason why I'm saying that, though, is because this, the one notable woman character in this movie is like nothing she she is nothing she is there purely as a this would not pass the uh what's it called the becktail test or something the becktail the bechtel test bechtel <laughs> yeah <laughs> no it would not we're not even close uh she doesn't even have a conversation with another woman at any point <laughs> no uh and even if she did every conversation in this movie is about the main character so <laughs> i mean it was never going to happen but uh yeah so we have um him and sort of on death row but of course he just disappears the, the guards go into his cell and he's not there and it's like where is he and they actually tease the build up to him a little bit we see him obviously like picking up some clothes in the forest but i do like that the detective that's well, not even the detective it's cobb it's cobb who goes to the scientist who's the brother of the character in the first film whose name is griffin dr griffin and he goes to us like, hey, you, you know, you must have helped him escape. You must know where he is. He's very, you know, intrigued to know. And, but, you know, Griffin denies it and says he doesn't know anything. And that's all it is to it. Uh, but of course he does. Of course him and Helen know exactly what they were planning. This was all a thing because the pardon, the, the, the appeals weren't going through. They were waiting up all night for them. And this is kind of the uh, their plan. So, yeah, we get the Invisible Man. I, I looked it up. Yes. There's one female credited under gowns. So one in the wardrobe department. <laughs> yes. Okay. There you go. Who simply one. provided gowns. Who provided gowns. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's not surprising. The time period, sadly, means that I wouldn't expect there to be a lot of female staff members on it, but... No. I mean, it's a bit mean for us to pick on this film specifically. It's not like this is the like a no, no, that's just the time. Yeah, a, a notable example of the time period, but I'm pretty sure like most makeup artists were also men. That's probably true. I bet that shifted at some point though. Yeah. I bet it shifted. Um, I don't know. The men still can't be makeup artists, so I'm sure that there is. But uh... oh yeah, I'm sure there's a ton. But it's just not something like you. I don't know if you would think like a makeup artist. If you go and get your makeup done, it's probably going to be by a woman. There are men that do it. There but was uh, a... I, I think at the time it was more considered artistry, which tended to be more male-dominated. I think there was a... Who was it? There was an actor recently. Someone was telling stories about an actor being an asshole on set. And they said something like... Because I think the, the, the first AD was a woman. And they went on like a tirade saying the first lady can't be a woman. A woman can't do that job. She should be doing makeup or wardrobe. And I think that's what I had in my head when I was critiquing the movie for not, not having mm. enough women staff. Which again, is unfair to critique this movie specifically because all movies from this time period will be under the same boat. But um, I think that's what I had in my head when I cracked that, that dig. Mm. But, yeah, that's true. Oh, oh, who was it? Oh, that's going to bug me. It was like a notable, it was an older actor. But it was like a notable actor. I, I forget now. But... Uh, I did not expect that tangent. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to leave it in because I, I think it's a reasonable bit of conversation, but... Sure. 
Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, but poor Nan Gray, the only female representation at this on the on on TV on on the screen, and uh, she's not very good. I yes. mean, she's a fine actress. I, I'm sure she's just she's written to faint and to only talk about her man. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I can't even tell if she's a good actress or not because she doesn't really have anything. <laughs> I mean, she she seems like on par for this type of role at the time, but I mean, I don't, I don't like. Yes. Can you drop her into modern movie? <laughs> like, I mean, that's probably she unfair as well. Worried but... and pretty at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> You're hired. I want to meet the actress who's pretty until she tries to look worried, and then all the prettiness goes away. I want to see. <laughs> I want to see who can pull that off. That sounds more more special to me. <laughs> yeah, she's even doing it on the poster. <laughs> Um, so, this old man, Jeffrey, goes to meet her at some secret boarding house somewhere, um, and he's all bandaged up, and he's, and you know, that's just kind of where I was thinking, ah, he's a little bit duller, he's, 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 because he's far too normal, he's talking about being worried. He is getting a little bit, like, of a temper, he's getting annoyed because the dog outside keeps barking, mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of the first signs that he's maybe starting to lose it a little bit, he's starting to go, yeah, just a touch, but... Uh, a policeman even comes around uh, not too long and sort of basically thinks there's something suspicious going on and kind of barges his way in and go, goes up to the up to the, the room and sees sees uh, Jeffrey and Jeffrey in the bandages is like basically tells him to piss off <laughs> he gets really stern with him and just tells him to go and he calls it in though he goes downstairs and calls it in and the police just like, oh, we got him, right? Don't, whatever you do, don't let him take off his clothes. And I laughed out loud because the, the policeman's <laughs> yeah. line is, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't worry about that, sir. There's a woman there. <laughs> There's a woman locked in the room with him. I'm sure they'll keep their clothes on. <laughs> I don't know if this is, like, innocence <laughs> speaking here, <laughs> but I feel like, I feel like I would be more expecting of the clothes coming off because of that reason. Just... If, if you know just just by my gut instinct on the on the situation yeah. at hand yeah that was a really funny scene i yeah. don't know if it was intentionally but <laughs> yeah i don't know if it was intentional either uh but if i it's before this as well because the policeman the, the chief that is he he goes to uh, griffin as well at the lab to try and mm -hmm. try and question like hey like you know your brother invented a serum that came from this flower and he became invisible and he only became visible again once he it's basically an exposition scene if you hadn't seen the first movie and yeah and we get the great scene with the gerbils. Oh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. the guinea get... pigs. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, the guinea pig that, that is invisible and then the skeleton comes back. I actually thought it was dead because the skeleton wasn't moving, but that's just a limitation of the effect. <laughs> because once, yeah. the, once the rest of it comes back, it starts moving. And I'm like, oh, it wasn't dead. I, I thought it was dead the whole and time. And then it dies. Yeah, and then it dies, yes. <laughs> I just like the little, inv the little invisible. Like you, It goes from like three cages full of guinea pigs with these little harnesses on into just like three cages of harnesses moving around on, the, on their own i loved it i thought it was so cute <laughs> well what, what late about this though is that there's the chief coming to him and saying hey like i've looked into you and i know who your brother was and i know that this all exists mm -hmm. so, so we i have a connection to the first film well we have a connection but I, I, it's going back to what i like most about the movie is that he he starts mm -hmm. to plan around the fact that he's invisible he starts to anticipate it because... I like how jovial he is about everything too. Like he's always smiling, but he knows what's going on. He feels smart, I think, because he's like cracked yeah. it. He's like he knows he's invisible. So like, you think you were going to outsmart us all that none of us would think, oh, he's invisible because that's so extreme. But no, no, I'm smart enough that I figured this out yeah. right from the I don't start. Know. I like his attitude. I like his, uh, <laughs> I like how happy he is about like he's in this situation. It doesn't come off as. Do I think like, he's just happy to be there? <laughs> it's just like I don't know. It is good. Well, I think, I think it makes sense, because if you think about it, how often does he get to, like, try and hunt an invisible man? This is such a yeah. unique, like, fun <laughs> case for him. He's like, oh, this is exciting. It's an invisible You're right, culprit. he has studied. He's kind of like an invisible man fanboy. Yeah. Um, you know, he's probably... He's, how many people has he hunted down in his career? He's, you know, he's already, maybe the first, like, you know, dozen arrests and you know, the first big murder that he got, was that was probably exciting, but they've all been kind of the same since then. He does his job, he's good at it, he knows what he's doing. But it's just same old, same old. And then all of a sudden, a challenge emerges. The invisible mm -hmm. man's on the loose. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense to me. He was I good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, but the, I would uh, be happy too. But Griffin calls uh, Jeffrey. I think it's before the, the policeman thing happens. Where he's like, hey, he's on to us. Like, he immediately figured out. Actually, that may even be a phone call. That may be when Jeffrey goes to see him afterwards, actually. Because Jeffrey... Uh, 
escapes the, the house because the cop goes back upstairs and sees that the clothes are on the floor and he's like he's like my god he took off his clothes <laughs> <laughs> but he, he goes to uh to see to see uh griffin um which is funny because the police now are looking for an invisible man it seems quite like almost stupid of him to just like w- saunter in and like leaving the doors open in front of the receptionist i'm like you're leaving witnesses all over the place who are seeing evidence of invisible people like you have to be sly about this you have to be right. be coy <laughs> the, the thing that made me giggle about this scene though is when uh when he goes to see griffin and he sits down in his chair and he's still not wearing any clothes like do you think mm-hmm. You think Griffin would have like wanted to put a towel down first or something? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you think Griffin's thinking about how the hairy ball sack is sweating all over his chair? <laughs> yeah, I think it's leather. <laughs> <laughs> Farthest thing from his but actually, I, I did kind of like the contrast. Admittedly, it makes Nan seem a bit more hysteric because she faints when she because because we should mention that when he takes off the clothes we see the start of it and he's unwrapping the mm-hmm. bandages it does look quite good like it looks yeah, it does. it's a bit more advanced than the first movie because we see him like take off more of the clothes sort of in camera uh, yeah and there's a part i'm not sure what, when it happens it, it might be later but he takes off the goggles and you can see through the bandages like through mm-hmm. the eye holes into the back of the head and it, it is just a like rear projection or whatever image in it but it, you know it's kind of a neat effect for the time I yeah, thought, yeah. I thought it was uh, really like well done. But for like what, I was saying, for four days, of yeah. post production. That's well, I, th- I, th- I think it ended up in longer on that. I think they were given four days. I don't think they actually okay. did it four days. <laughs> I think that's well. No, I'm less impressed. Yeah, but no, like I was saying though, it kind of makes her look bad because she's so hysterical. Because by comparison, Griffin, when when Jeffrey comes in and he starts talking to him, he just like he's just, he's just so calm and he expects yeah. it. He's like, "Oh, hey, Griffin, you're you're here." Or, or sorry, he Jeffrey, just, you're here. A, like he just grabs a newspaper off the reception's desk and walks yeah. in, and so I mean, Griffin just sees a floating newspaper and is like, "Okay, I got it. I know." He's like, "Hey, Jeff. On. Hey, Jeff. What's <laughs> yeah. up? What's happening? How's it hanging on my chair? I see, or <laughs> not? Is the case maybe?" <laughs> <laughs> we just spray that down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I almost think like, there's this comedy in mind here where not even in a full-on comedy but I, given that he's not like p- proper insane yet I can almost see like in a modern movie like the joke being cracked where he's like hey Griffin try not to think about the fact that my ball sack is on your chair right now <laughs> <laughs> try not to think about it it just it, it's like the movie face, forgets like, that he's naked totally naked they do, men- they do mention that because when he's getting undressed to leave when the police officer's coming back up he's like oh luckily it's warm outside like he, he does mention that at least so. yeah because that would be an issue like you would get cold outside unless it was warm enough yeah i haven't spent much time running around naked outside but i assume it would be easier to be you'd cold. want to do it on a warm day yeah yeah you might do it on a warm day uh makes sense <laughs> so uh basically he wants to investigate the crime and it's not long after this where uh i think you pointed out this was alfred from the batman tv show shows up yeah. he plays a, yeah he plays a character he's like the sort of like the head workman at the mine so he works directly for mr cobb but he comes in to yell at griffin and tell him that cobb's going to like get rid of the doctor and scientist division or something i don't know <laughs> like it was all whatever but uh basically he leaves uh storms off driving his car and uh, Jeffrey, why did they name them Jeffrey and Griffin? I'm just gonna say Vincent Price. Vincent Price is like he ends up on top. And keep in mind, this is a 1940s car. It's this old, you know, ramshackle, rickety thing, and he just opens up the hood at one point <laughs> on, on the car and it just yeah. it freaks out. And it, it starts to torment. And this is where the movie perked up for because up until now there's a couple of lo- little things I liked, but I was a little bit. I don't want to say bored. This is the first, like, antics scene we get, though. This is where I perked up, because he sort of takes him into the forest, and he's just tormenting him. He's just, you know, scaring the shit out of him and moving things around him and... Telling him he's the ghost of of Radcliffe. Yeah, yeah, he's telling him he's a ghost, and he's... Because he actually questions, like, yeah, but you just sneeze. It's like, it's cold in the other world! (laughs) That was funny. (laughs) (laughs) I'm a ghost. It's you. Ghost can sneeze. <laughs> it's cold over here. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, that was that was amusing. That was a good line. Um, but he uh, basically gets the guy to confess that he knows who killed his brother. It was Cobb himself. Cobb came out of the main after, and Cobb paid him off to like say that it was it was uh, it was Jeffrey because obviously Cobb doesn't want to go down for it. So mm-hmm. um, he's like, oh great, and he actually 
and I, I, this is the part I really liked of this, is he lets him think that he's gone because he shuts up. And then, the, you know, this guy's like, oh, oh, like, he, he, where are you? Where are you? He's really scared. And he sort of, like, hightails out of there and he gets all the way back to his, like, his little house, his little cottage. And he thinks he's, like, he starts he packing. the door. Yeah, he starts locking the door. we can see the, the window in the background. And he starts packing his suitcase. He's going to go on the run for it because he just wants to get away and be away from this invisible man. And then, of course, Ghost. he starts t- talking again. Uh, well, yes, to him it's a ghost, you're right. Um, and he, basically, he ties him down here uh, for, because he wants to use him, obviously, as evidence later, because as the witness. Uh, I will say the effect of the uh, the rope tying around his feet uh, did look a little bit funny to me, because obviously it was kind of like stop motion style, but what I really liked about it in a kind of goofy way is that the carpet, there was like a rug underneath him, and every time it was like changing between the frames for the rope animation like to, to move you could actually see the the fibers and the carpet shifting depending uh-huh. on you because know, <laughs> presumably they had to like step on it to like you'll get the next bit ready so you could right. sort of see the carpet kind of you know going back and forth the grooves yeah i didn't notice i thought it was kind of interesting that he tied it tied the knot in a way where um if he wakes up you can easily untie it but <laughs> so I was confused by that. Like, why would you just tie it like that? Cause... Yeah. Well, it cuts away when we cut. But we get to see him later. We find out that he's actually left him. He does. He's done more work. He's he's put him up. Yeah. He's done more yeah. stuff to him. And yeah. it's a little. Well, it's really dark actually. What he does to him. And it, I mean, at first you're you're thinking this guy is the bad guy. He knows. He knows all this information. He knows why. Radcliffe's been put in prison um, unjustly, and. Uh, but he sort of becomes sympathetic in a way because he, he's doing this, you know, under uh, under somebody else's power. He's, he's a bit it, unlikable, but yeah, like, ultimately, he's a bit of a, a pawn. And you, yeah. feel, you feel bad for him later because the way his character kind of meets his demise is kind of dark and sad. So yeah, uh, but we'll get to that. Uh, basically, you know, the Invisible Man goes to Cobb at this point in Cobb's mansion. You know, he's got a big estate. And... You know, starts scaring the shit out of him. He's sitting in his rocking chair. He's like, I know you killed my brother. I know this. And the cop just starts, like, firing a gun at him, thinking, yeah. oh, I'll get lucky and hit him. <laughs> to keep shooting at him. Um, yeah, risky. And the police show up, and it, they're like, okay, lock all the windows and doors so he can't get out. So he's trapped in this building. And mm-hmm. this is the stuff I love. I love that they come, like, they come prepared with, like, canisters of gas that they can release into rooms so they can see him. Uh, obviously, the chief, as we mentioned, is always smoking a cigar, and he even recommends that Cobb start doing so as well. But I like mm-hmm. that they literally put Cobb in a room and have four policemen stand around him, like close up, so that he's a, you know, he's completely circled by people, so that if yeah. the invisible man can't get can't get to him. And I'm like, yeah, I love this. Do all these like mechanics, and they have, they have guards outside, and it's pissing a rain, and that's actually partly why he's trapped because if he goes outside. You know, they're going to see where he is. Which we see a glimpse of. Like, he tries to go outside and yeah. then you can just see a silhouette in the rain. And I'll be honest, I was kind of thinking, this is going to look bad. And obviously, it looks a lot better when they do these sort of things now. But to his credit, it for 19... Yeah, for 1940, this looked all right. Uh, yeah. Uh, just to sort of, you know, the outline of the sort of the top of his head and shoulders and, mm-hmm. like, just a little bit. But, you know, it looked not bad. Uh, so... Obviously, he ends up with knocking out one of the, the people who are wearing like, the full body suits and gas masks and puts on the gas mask and all that, and then just escorts his girlfriend out of the, the building yeah. and no one's he the says, wiser. do that thing you do, and she faints. <laughs> <laughs> At least they have a running joke with it, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, he ends up back, um, like, he's, he's, he calls them and says, hey, I'm at uh, Griffin's place, you know, come over and we'll celebrate. And Griffin's really in a bad mood because he's not figured out the cure. Because remember, there's still no cure to like turn him back into like a, a you know, visible yeah. person. He's feeling a lot of guilt about it too because he he willingly gave him the invisible serum without knowing that he didn't have an antidote. Yeah, and this is where he starts to kind of really act out because when they go over and they're having dinner, he's like, you know, he's laughing. He's saying, "Ah, hey, this is." Great. Oh, he's so scared. I see that. I was laughing. I, I filled them. Ma- men are idiots. Like, you know, birds and dogs and cats, they know I'm there immediately, but the human beings, oh, once you take away their vision, all of a sudden you can play with them and they don't, they're none the wiser. They're idiots. Yeah. <laughs> he's starting to feel pretty powerful. Yeah, he's like, yes, I'm basically a god. All this power is intoxicating. And at this point, Griffin's like, all right, you know what? 
I'm going to like, knock him out and tie him up because <laughs> so he, he, he spikes his drink and there's all like I thought Griffin have a poker face like every time he like uh, Vincent goes, Price goes to drink, drink it? yeah drink it. <laughs> <laughs> every time he goes to drink his thing Griffin is like such staring and I'm like of course he's going to suspect something suspicious is going on with the drink if you're not drinking yours come on <laughs> act casual you tit oh, I know jeez he didn't it's not he like he spiked all the drinks. No, just, no. Just one. It, <laughs> just think around. Don't what's just funny sit there. Is the Vincent Price gets uh, gets like agitated because like, oh you're not respecting me you're, you're not, you know basking in my glory and he storms off but then he comes back and he's taken off his bandage he's like okay now I can relax with just the, the robe on so he's invisible and this is what we were talking yeah. about earlier where you see him drinking uh and his head's like you know and, yeah all the bandages know, are gone yeah. so he just looks like a headless man. And it's not as good. Obviously, this is one of these effects where I'm like, this would be much better today because they'd actually show the fluid like mm-hmm. going down his throat and, you know. Um, but hey, that's what it is. Uh, but it takes a long time. Like, it, there's, so, there's so much like teasing that he's maybe going to take a drink. But, although, not in the way you'd expect him to because I think if you if it was a tease, like most other movies, if they were going to tease someone taking a drink of something that had something in it, they'd be going like this. Like, and another thing, <laughs> like you know they'd, yeah. all, they'd almost take a sip and then like start talking because something would occur to them and they don't do that it, it doesn't hold it up in front of them and almost drinks it's just always sitting there but there's at the same time there's a lot of teasing because it, it really draws it out how long it takes before he actually takes a drink mm-hmm. I don't know what my point was to all that but that's, uh, that's how it played no I mean it's a good scene it, we get to watch him go mad also mad with power which is what we've been expecting Oh yeah, do. he's laughing maniacally, he's doing all these things, and I'm like, man, yes, yes, yes. Get more of this Vincent Price, come on. Get yeah, you know, his allies are turning against him in the scene. Yeah, because he, cause he actually, I love, I love how he has like a, a proper chain with like a shackle on it uh, at the ready to like pin him down in the other room. But mm-hmm. uh, Vincent Price plays along, and he's like, oh, because he wakes up quite quickly, so like, oh, I'm glad you did this, you're right, you're right, I'm going off the deep end, yes, 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 I'm glad you did this. But then he like, asks for some water and then like throws it in his face and escapes. Um, mm-hmm. And water, no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My one I, weakness. <laughs> I'm melting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he took it by surprise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if it hits you in the eye in the right way, it will sting a little bit just because you're not expecting it. <laughs> if your eyes are shut, it'll do nothing to you. Water hitting your face means nothing. I mean, unless it's really cold or warm, I guess, and you're not. You know, it's like a, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but this is room temperature. This is room temperature water. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, a little silly, but it's but fun. So he goes back to the mansion where Cobb is and manages to get inside. Um, And basically says to Cobb, right, we're going to get out of here, so play along and talk your way out. Uh, and he makes him, like, you know... I think he knocks out the first guard because he's not doing very well. But the one at the door he makes, like, no, no, convince him, convince him that you need to leave. Uh, and he takes him with him to the apartment where he's got, uh, the, the, the minor guy. Uh, which we go in and he's actually standing on a chair with a noose around his neck. Uh, mm-hmm. as well as having his hands and, uh, feet tied and he's gagged. And he ungags him. And he's like, okay, tell Cobb everything. Like, I know everything now. And he, you know, he says, oh, Cobb came out of the mine. I saw him do it. And he paid me off. And I think this is the thing where, I mean, we have no reason to doubt any of this information, really, but I, I don't think it really sinks in how evil Cobb is until he actually steps in and kicks away the chair to kill Griffin so that he can't tell this to anyone else. And it's like, oh, yeah. you're actually an evil bastard. Oh, that's a, that was really dark. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because he's been, I mean, even though we know that he's our villain, he's been nothing but, like, really nice the entire movie, although he is a little bit chummy with uh, with the lady. Yeah, he's a little bit of a slime ball in the way he tries to defend himself. He's, you know, he's a bit of that sort of villainous coward when he's like scared mm-hmm. of the Invisible Man, but he's not really come across as evil yet. And this is the moment where it's like, oh no, you're actually completely, totally evil. All right. Yeah. Uh, do we do we know his motivation? I might have missed it. Like his motivation for the murder is it just to climb the ranks? In I think the business. It was. Or was it to get the girl because he could frame him? I don't his think it brother. was. I don't think it was the girl. They definitely said something about him and his brother, like were becoming like I, too powerful. Like their like company or something. Like it, I, 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 honestly, it was such a quick point that they made in the movie. I didn't really catch the, the exact details, but it was definitely about yeah, him and his brother. Uh, like either like they're going to take over the town because their their business is better or fairer or something. I don't know. Um, okay. 
but it was definitely that. It was it was it was a business evil business motivation. Greed. Greed. Yes, it was. Got greed. it. Yes. Uh, so they have a bit of a fight here, um, and I did like this: is that the Cobb turns off the light, smashes the light, and says, "Hey, now we're equals. Now you can't see me either. Mm-hmm. You know what are you now without your advantage?" Uh, kind of thing. I, I like that. I like them playing with that. But it all it all boils down to him chasing them through the street up to the main car and the big ramp and all that. And they're fighting up, and there's a crowd forming, watching like, this fight play out where one of them's visible, one isn't. And eventually the chief shows up and basically it takes a shot because he's assuming that Vincent Price is on top strangling Cobb on the main cart, which is now they're now up the top of the, the thing before it comes down. So there you go. Know, yeah, like I, I think the, the article that I read said was two stories high. It looks about two stories. Yeah. And it takes a shot and then he stopped being strangled. So Cobb's like, oh, I think you got him. I think you got him. But then the main cart, like the side hatch opens and he falls down with the, with the, the coal and whatever down into the and it's a real guy ground. who does the stunt yeah no, it looks it looks good uh mm-hmm. uh you know nice simple stunt i was work. surprised i was i was looking for a dummy like oh mm. no it's a real guy i guess he falls he probably falls into a giant balloon but it looked good oh for sure yeah but i mean it, yeah, it looks it looks solid um and like okay where's the invisible man are they ever going to find him uh what's you know what's happening but yeah they're all does... looking through the rocks and stuff for him but yeah it's how do you find the invisible I mean, head? I guess the one thing we'll say about Cobb in terms of a positive point is that he didn't want anyone to know that he, what he'd done because he was still alive and he's selfish and greedy. But he does make a choice in his dying last breath because he mm-hmm. dies from this fall. He does make a choice. Well, I'm dying now. I don't really care if they know. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let them know that I did it. Because he, he tells them. He, he, tells, he, he says to Nan, hey, I, I was me that killed Michael. It's his, his dying words. And I'm like, you know yeah, what, he that... wanted to tell her. Yeah. Um, he, he requested for her. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess she, he wants her to at least not completely hate him <laughs> in death. Like, oh, maybe she'll see a little bit of good in me yeah, uh, maybe. afterwards. Except I, you know, killed a man. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, that's... Maybe his last words were supposed to be, I killed Michael so I could be with you because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he but, died <laughs> but he dies yes uh, but I just think it's interesting that he you know because he could have out of spite left it so that it still looked like yeah, Jeff was a killer yeah but he didn't so you know it's, I mean maybe the reasons were selfish but it's something uh, we see like a scarecrow like uh, like the clothes come off uh, Vincent Price is grabbing some clothes but he, he is seemingly shot it's worth mentioning his blood is also invisible uh, yeah. as much as it would be quite fun if it wasn't like if, we, you know, if he did get hurt we see like blood spraying and stuff like I would definitely want that in a movie now <laughs> I would want visible blood <laughs> yeah I wonder I wonder if we get that in the future do we get like maybe a hollow man I don't know I don't know uh, I guess the argument is, is that if the blood's visible then shouldn't we see it inside his body when he's walking yeah, around yeah that's true but I'm like nah but it's shielded with invisible skin I know that <laughs> makes no sense in a weird way but well it kind of works with the with the recent movie it, oh, it does because yeah, it's not—it's not his body. You know, it's, it's a suit. It's technology. Actually, yeah. I would say this. How about how about this? How about it is invisible until it leaves his body and then it becomes visible because it's separated. Mm. I think that works. <laughs> that works in my my head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That logic sound. But the, he stumbles into the the lab, and he's dying, and you know Griffin's feeling horrible because he's got no cure. Uh, I, I do like the scene with the scarecrow though, when he's like slowly putting the, the clothes on and he's talking mm. about his injury and it is just a very like sad moment for him where he's at like the bottom mm. yeah it was good like it was just him mon- it was the invisible man vincent price monologuing sounding very vincent price like and you have this thing where we know that the, the the serum the invisible serum makes makes the people go mad so mm-hmm. we can't really hold the fact that he was trying to kill someone against them because it, it, it was like an influence. There was something making him kind of go down that path. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so at the end, when he essentially, they stumble into a, a cure because they have to give him a transfusion. Um, and he for some re- too much invisible blood. Yeah, and for some reason, they, they, they need like dozens of people to give him blood. I mean, okay, some of them won't be compatible because uh, they, they don't say blood type, but the doctor does say we're going to have to test everyone first. I assume that's why. I assume they actually have to check. Hey, are you A, B, whatever? Um, but 
basically, and I, I can see this coming because the first one doesn't have a happy ending, and I thought this one probably should. And I was like, oh, the transfusion is going to cure him because it's going to replace all of his blood. It's going to like replace the, you know, the, the serumed blood, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. Right. Yeah. Um. So, and this is probably, the, I think, the worst effect in the movie for me, just because it's <gasps> so cartoony. Really? I thought it looked great. Oh come on! See, I mean, the the seeing the veins on their own were okay as they started to come back in, but see, once you saw the muscles and stuff, it just looked like a painting that they had over the top. Yeah, of them. but it, it was so much better than I was expecting it to be. I wasn't even expecting. A, I I thought it was going to do like a cheap just fade and it's Vincent Price, but they okay. did different layers and stuff. I thought that was really impressive. Actually, oh, no, okay, I I will give you that. I appreciate the creativity and that they thought about it and tried to do something that was a bit more. Uh, I mean, uh, scientifically accurate is probably not the right phrase here, but you know what I mean? Like, something yeah. with a bit more nuance that says, hey, we thought about, like, okay, the veins would come back first because the blood's the first thing that's visible because it's the new blood, and then that would extend to this and this. Um, but I, I did think some of it looked kind of cartoony, so, I'll, you know, I'll say... I liked it. Okay. <laughs> it's got a charm. I'm not going to say it's too bad. Um, I, although I did wonder why his hair came back so quick, because I was sure the hair would be the last thing that comes back. Yeah, it is perfect. Because I, I would assume that the hair wouldn't be back until it grows out. Like, you know, because the, the, the hair that's there is still invisible, but then mm -hmm. it would gradually... So there'd be, like, invisible hair at the top, and then it would grow out. Kind of like... I just imagine, like, someone's dyed their hair and the roots are coming in. The roots would be visible, but the, the rest would be invisible. <laughs> I think the the worst part about being an invisible person would be that you wouldn't be able to wear shoes. I agree. Walking about barefoot outside sounds like Walking an absolute over nightmare. all that coal? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Without um, any shoes on? This, I, I'm not a big fan of, like, you know, honest trailers or how things should have ended or these types of stuff, but I do think there's a joke here about, like, almost a Mystery Science Theater thing where you could dub in like him going, ow, ow, ouch, ow, ooh, ooh, as they're going up the call at the end, like, ow, ooh, ooh, ow, ow, ooh. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I could see that. I could see that. Uh, but, you know, it's, 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 it's a fun time. I, I, I think it's kind of a, you know, lukewarm, watchable sequel. It has some things in it that I quite like. I like some of the ideas that are taken forward, but I don't think the characters are that great or... Or I'm not invested in the actual, like, who, you know, revealing who actually killed the brother plot. I don't really care about any of that. I thought it was, I thought it was an interesting way to, to take a sequel. Because, I mean, how do you make a sequel to um, The Invisible Man when The Invisible Man dies at the end of it? Yeah, but you're Invisible Man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I will say, I was expecting this to be completely standalone. I was surprised that the first movie was in continuity. And that they actually mm -hmm. used the fact that, hey, in the first movie, he went insane and then died and we couldn't cure him. We're actually going to use that to build the drama of, can we save this one this time? Can I solve the problem that was in the first movie to save this new guy? I actually thought that was quite, more than I was expecting for the time period in terms of sequel continuity. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I mean, my expectations for the next one are low. <laughs> the Invisible Woman, I believe, is next. Oh. Oh, you think it was next? Um, revenge or something? Nah, that's not next. Uh, the lady one's next. Okay, well that'll be interesting then. It'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting. I assume uh, it would be just another Vincent Price one since he survives. Well, what's interesting is that uh, so the next one is the Invisible Woman, which stars Virginia Bruce uh, as the lead character, and then Invisible Agent and the Invisible Man's Revenge are the two that are after that, and that's actually a new actor. That's John Hall playing whoever the character is in that. But interestingly, Vincent Price comes back for Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Oh, which is also on our list. Right? And then uh, Arthur Franz, who's another new person, plays him in the uh, Abbott and Costello meets the Invisible Man. Um, oh, okay. Well, that's all we'll be watching. Yeah. I mean, he's in the Frankenstein one. I don't know. I don't know. They're short enough. Maybe we do like a double feature as a bonus episode or something. I don't know. Sure. Because uh, they're not yeah, really... They're not serious sci-fi movies, so I think there's an argument to be made that that should be a bonus Patreon episode rather than... The, the only Abbott and Costello I think I've ever seen is... I think they meet the mummy. That's the one I've seen. Mm. I'll, I've not seen any of the Abbott and Costello ones, so that's all news to me. I, watched but... I, was, I mean, I watched that one when I was really young. I don't really remember. But we, we have three more serious ones in this particular series, <laughs> which is... And then we get Hollow Man. No, then we get the Timmy Chase one. Then Hollow Man. Oh, we did the entire Invisible Saga <laughs> going oh, through the. Is that not 
part of the deal. We can do it. I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> do, I've never seen the Chevy Chase one, and I've never I seen. Mean, we do one of them a year. It's... <laughs> That's the uh, rate. Well, I was thinking we'd speed up a little bit after this one. Yeah, I actually was. Uh, once I started the movie, I. I couldn't really remember if what happened in the first one, so I thought, oh, I, I wish we would have done this a little bit sooner. Because I yeah. had to look it up. No, I mean, I think maybe, uh, maybe not. I think Planet of the Apes we're going to do a little bit quicker, but I think that we'll try and maybe hit the next one of these sometime in the uh, early next year, uh, but okay. my guess. Yeah. Every maybe, say, four months, something like that. We'll maybe do another Invisible Man. Or Woman, Invisible as the case woman. Me. Yeah. So, hey, I mean, maybe they did. They, 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 Took her, took her complaints on board uh, with a time machine that there's only one woman character in this and she's just kind of a blank sheet of paper and yeah. they said we're going to make the next one be an invisible woman <laughs> so we'll see I mean it's a little bit easier to, to I mean to, to deal with the fact that there's a naked woman riding around than a naked man oh god is there going to be a joke where she like runs into someone and the, he's got his hands out like that Oh no! He's be, oh, <laughs> Not sorry. At this time period, I don't think so. I think they could get away with it because she's invisible. I think that's the only way it would be okay. Is because she's invisible, they can crack I a don't joke. Know. <laughs> okay, maybe not quite with the hands out like that, but I'm almost willing to bet you there will be a joke in this where someone goes, "Oh, sorry," does this have to touch something? They wouldn't really be too specific about what what he touched by accident, mm -hmm. but I'm almost willing to bet you there's going to be a joke. <laughs> or maybe it'll be her saying get your hands off that you something or other like damn dirty ape <laughs> you're crossing the streams now come on <laughs> crossing the streams <laughs> never cross your streams all right we should probably rate the invisible man returns so uh what are you giving invisible man returns i enjoyed this movie i thought it was pretty good it was a decent sequel um i i liked the characters i mean I, I, you're right claude rains is a, has a lot more energy and it has a better maniacal laugh so i you know i don't like all of them but i do really like the the lead inspector guy i think he's kind of a show stealer and um i don't know i like the scientist guy too i thought he was kind of fun it's all right <laughs> uh, maybe it's just the guinea pig scene that really enjoyed <laughs> um I want to give it a, a seven point five. Okay, I think that's that's, that's not un, unfair necessarily. I'm, I'm going a bit lower. I'm going to go with a straight six. I think it's a, it's a solid six. It's you know it's very watchable, but uh, it's it's not the monumental film the first one is by any means. It's not it's, you know it's must see cinema history. But if you like you know completing these franchises, this is not a painful one to sit through, and there is some fun ideas and some things that I will give it props for. So uh, there you go. That's the Invisible Man Returns. On the Atomic Cinema Experimental. Try to put the title of the show. <laughs> um, if you made it this far in the review, put the word guinea pig into the comments on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to make Tara pose for the thumbnail. Tara, I'm going to say three, two, one, and say pose. Three, two, one, pose. <laughs> you should just make me a silhouette. Yeah, part of me's thinking that we should I should just get like two hats and just put two hats <laughs> on like invisible heads on the thumbnail. Yeah. Um I'm not gonna lie. In fact, you know what? So Tara can't see this shit, but in post production I'm going to make myself disappear there and be invisible for the rest of the review. <laughs> you did that with the first one. No no, we started it invisible. I'm gonna actually Oh no no, you did that for the invisible man for screams. Yes, that was for screams, yes. Not for the first one we did on it. <laughs> Um, but yes, I, do you know what? I'm not gonna lie. I was tempted to literally record, like, you know, however long this was gonna last, like, just a lot of empty chair space and just put my, just take myself out the video entirely and just have <laughs> an empty chair, just have me talking to no one, yeah. But then in the next one, Invisible Woman, I would swap it and you swap it, yeah. I would, I would say, right, Tara, do me a favor, leave your camera on for like an hour <laughs> so that just I can randomly record. like. Yeah. Guess like wander by. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then I'll, then I'll I'll put that I'll take you out of the next one. Um, but that said though, if I take you out of the video, of the next one there might be a riot amongst our audience. So uh, I'm not going to. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway.
Mario, eh? Yeah, that's uh, been the Invisible Man Returns. Uh, we mentioned Patreon earlier, patreon.com slash TV. Uh, if you want to support us for free, which you can do, obviously that's super tempting because it's, well, free, uh, you can hit the like button on YouTube. That's super important and lets us find more audience members. You can also, of course, uh, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever your, pad- pod- your podcast, your podcast, I'm from podcast. Brooklyn all, all of a sudden. Uh, you get your podcast more, from? Um, Massachusetts. Is it? Sorry, oh, I went full Boston. Mm-hmm. Like Marky Mark. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, give us a five star review on there. That helps us out a lot. And of course, you can uh, get us on Twitter at the Ace Podcast. And that pretty much does it. Uh, Tara, do you want to promote another piece of uh, Male Fuzz TV content? Uh, or maybe even some other content that you're on that we maybe just started, perhaps, that they'd be excited about? Oh, uh, sure. Um, if you enjoy science fiction, we have just started reviewing a science fiction classic television series called Babylon 5. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, so yeah, watch along with us. We're just a few episodes into season one, so it'll be easy to catch up. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I'm really excited about covering that show. And we're, you know, we've recorded two so far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, more and more soon, and uh, I'm excited, so. Hopefully you'll enjoy join us for the ride. You can get that on YouTube, of course, nice and easy. Uh, but that is us. So thank you once again for watching or listening. Oh, I should tell you what's coming next time. The last like three episodes, we've forgotten to tell them what's we coming next. Getting. I know, and I really should do it before the plugging. But this is the bonus bit you get after the plug is that I'll tell you what's coming next time, so you can prepare for it. Uh, That's right. So next time we're actually doing the uh, Patreon vote winner that won last month, and that is the Pixar film Wally. Wow, I'm so excited that this one went because for some reason Transformers the movie was on the list and I did not want to watch that. And that almost won. That was that was very that that was in the lead at one point and then it managed to get flipped and Wally kind of took the lead and was able to secure it. But Transformers the movie almost got there. I mean, I just have no desire to watch that. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since it would start the Transformers franchise, which is obviously a daunting task. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad it didn't win. Hey, Tara, as a sci-fi franchise, at some point, we're going to have to do it. When we run out of sci-fi movies. <laughs> in the same way that me and Tim had to do the Saw franchise, <laughs> me and you're going to have we to... We already do... did the Bumblebee movie, so we kind of just skipped to the end. Yeah, but that was a prequel. That was set before all <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> I'm going to have to, like, uh, you know that thing you do with kids where you give them something nice along with the better thing? I'm going to have to do that with Transformers. I'm going to be like, okay, we'll do Transformers, but we also get to do the Robocop series or something, like, alongside it, like, okay. hey. Okay. <laughs> here's your treat. At the same time. Here's your treat. If we do Transformers, you get Robocop. If you do Transformers 2, you get Robocop 2. That's the one. Yeah, but how many good Robocops are there? Um, the answer that I give may surprise you. Oh. I don't know if it will. I probably won't, but... Well, good night, everyone. Yeah, that's it. That's the show. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching and listening. We always appreciate it. Keep watching science fiction. And computer, at Salsa. Orders to shoot on sight. I thought he said the bloke was invisible. <laughs>